First of all, I just want to really thank Inbal. Uh, this has been a, a freaking awesome opportunity. I also don't think anyone in here realizes uh, just how much she does for this conference and for other conferences that she's involved in. She was also the program chair of uh, C++ Now, which just happened a month ago. And so she has been all over the place. Um, Inbal is like one of my closest friends and we have, I, I, she's like one of the, I'm one of the people that she feels comfortable complaining to about these things. And so I can tell you for certain that like you don't know how much work she's done for this. It's incredible. So um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really honored also to be one of the people that she feels comfortable complaining about these things too. So yeah, um, let's, uh, yeah. We're, we're, we're truly grateful to have someone like that, especially uh, coming out of this community and, and, and building it up so big. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, implementation sameness in modern C++. Uh, this word sameness is a little weird, probably not something that you see often, and I did that on purpose. I didn't wanna use polymorphism or code reuse or something like that, because I think those words have some loadedness that comes from the way that we do C++ education, and I really wanna talk about practical use. Um, also, apologies in advance, I talk really fast. Um, and I know that this is not um, always easy to understand, so if I need to slow down, just like do something like that, or like um, watch the video at half speed maybe. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a lot of things I really wanna say, and I'm actually really excited about this. This is, um, this is like the first real software engineering talk I've given in a while. I've been giving these kind of cute programming talks, and I'm excited to give a real software engineering talk, but also um, I'm terrified. I um, haven't given a real engineering talk in a while. I've been playing around with these cute C++ tricks and like, oh, the language does this thing, right? Isn't that funny? You shouldn't do this, but it's funny. Um, and and that's, that's super fun, but like, and hard to criticize, which doesn't leave me open to criticism, but uh, this uh, is a real software engineering talk. You might disagree with me. You might be an expert and disagree with me. Um, that's okay. Um, but uh, I, this is things that I've extracted from programming at very, very large scales uh, for very, very long lived code bases. Um, and I'm trying to express that. So let's give it a shot. Um, it's also really hard to talk about sameness and repetition uh, of code in slides. I think often the maximum amount of code that people recommend you, um, that you be comfortable repeating uh, is roughly the amount of code that fits in a slide, which is kind of inconvenient, right? Uh, it's a little awkward. Uh, the, it's hard to show an example that's worth like extracting uh, into a re repetition pattern because, uh, or into a, into a form of sameness because it uh, doesn't fit on a slide. But uh, try to think critically about the concepts themselves rather than the specific examples. I think there's a lot of things that are easy to dismiss here as too fancy or too complicated because I can't fit enough code to justify it on the slide. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm mostly interested in very large scale code that's meant to be maintained for a very long time. Um, high-end software engineering environments, there are plenty of other uses for programming, right? There's competitive programming where you just wanna copy paste things as fast as you can, right? If you can't remember how to do a for loop, which hopefully you can, but you just copy the thing 10 times, right? Like that is not software engineering, but it is a completely valid use of programming. So um, I, I wanna, like if you feel attacked in this talk, um, it's entirely possible that your use case for programming doesn't fit into these software engineering scenarios. And so I think all of these are valid, um, but this is, these are the kind of uh, common, common storylines that I wanna get across here. Um, code is meant to be read by humans. Uh, if you are a professional software engineer, which most people in here are, uh, you should be able to come up with multiple ways to get your computer to do basically the same thing. Right, and software engineering is really the practice of incorporating how the reader will experience that code into your decision as to which of the ways you express something, right? Um, 
I'm also going to talk about cognitive load a lot, which is a, a term that is, it's not exactly a common word, so I thought I'd define it here just to be uh, safe. It's the amount of mental effort required to understand and use code. Um, cognitive load, reducing cognitive load is, should be your number one goal in any real code you write. Right? There, you should be able to come up with multiple ways to write it, and you should be choosing the one that reduces cognitive load the most. Um, I'm also going to talk about information loss, which is when the reader of the code doesn't have an easy way to retrieve a piece of information that's implicit or obvious to the writer of the code. The most common version of this is copy and paste, right? When you copy and paste something, you have a piece of information in your head that is a connection between the code you copied from and the code you pasted. And that connection isn't preserved. It's not preserved in your repository. It's not preserved in the source code. And when someone goes to read it, they have lost that connection. So really, um, I think that it's interesting to do this thought experiment where we look at code as if copy-paste didn't exist. What would languages look like? What would code look like if we disabled copy-paste in the editors of our engineers? Obviously, we are a long ways away from that. Our programming languages have too much boilerplate for that right now. But I think when we're making decisions, it's actually uh, an instructive thought exercise to think about what it would look like. How good would this code be if people couldn't copy paste? How good would this abstraction be if my junior developers weren't allowed to use copy paste? Right? Um, and I, I also want to, like, on an emotional level, connect with the fact that copy pasting code is, is, is selfish in a sense, right? It's, it saves you time at the expense of someone else's time, someone reading the code later, right? So one of the things that I, I've been trying to do is, is uh, I use a clipboard history, I go through my clipboard history at the end of a day of coding and look for big chunks of code and say, why did I copy that, right? Because I'm kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of, flow of uh, coding, not focusing really on what I'm actually doing all the time, and I might, might have made a mistake of accidentally copy-pasting too much, right? And go back and think about what information loss I might have caused for the reader. And that reader could be a year down the line, it could be five years down the line, it could be 20 years down the line. Um, I have uh, worked in a software engineering environment where I did get blame, and I got a punch card reader. Um, that is a real story, by the way. So, um, code lasts for a very long time. Non-themes of the talk, things that I don't really care about. I don't care how long it takes you to type something. Um, beyond the amount of time it actually takes you to implement something, I don't, take, I don't even care how long it takes you to type something. If you're typing most of your code, you need a better development environment, right? Your development environment should be completing after two or three characters to the thing that you intend to say, right? I don't care how long your function name is if it in reduces cognitive load. There's obviously a length at which it gets to be so long that it takes someone a while to read it, right? But if it's a, if it's a better description of the function, I don't care that it takes you a long time to type it. Um, I also don't care about adding a layer or two. Um, if you're sitting here and you can't think off of the top of your head immediately, like reflexively, what is the key binding to jump to the definition of a function and back? while you're editing, then you need a better IDE, right? I uh, quite frequently in code review, I will say, you need to extract this into a function. You've repeated it four times here. And someone will say, oh, it reduces the, the flow of the code. It's a complicated section, and you can't really tell what's going on if you move it into another function. And then when, when I ask them what are they using for their editor, they'll say something like, oh, I just use raw, raw VI. I, you know, or I use Vim directly. I use Emacs, and, and I have a couple plugins, but I don't use a language server, right? And, and if you're doing that, you're, you're hurting the quality of your code, and you're hurting your coworkers. Um, and so you should really think about using something more modern. There are key bindings in your favorite editor. I don't care if it's Vim, Emacs, Pyco, whatever. There are key bindings for IDEs. There's a great one that's a sponsor of this, this conference. It's the one I would use if I didn't work at Google. Um, and, and used for years since it was in, in uh, the, since the first day it went into public beta. So I have been a big fan of C-Lion. I'll go ahead and say it out loud. 
Um, there are great editors out there. So, um, I also, this is a controversial one, and some of you are going to hate me. I don't care about adding compilation cost, um, adding linear compilation cost. Um, distributed builds, caching, smaller files, modules can all help with this. These are all things you want to be doing anyway, right? And uh, compilation cost is much cheaper than developer time, right? And you should have ways that increased compilation cost doesn't cause increased developer time. Um, if those two things are correlated, then that's a problem also. Um, I think Vittorio had a good talk about decreasing compilation time. And most of it didn't involve using simpler C++, right? That doesn't mean, like, I've heard people say, oh, if you use a template, your code is going to take longer to compile. And I'm like, yeah, but if you use a template, your code is going to take less time to read. And that's far more important, right? Um, but definitely be aware of nonlinear scaling and compilation costs. And more importantly, be aware of weird language features that increase the cognitive load of your reader, right? If the person reading your code doesn't understand the abstraction that you're using, then it's not reducing cognitive load. Now, maybe that means you need to have better education at your company. Maybe it means that you need to work with junior developers to understand new things. But until you are at that point, you're not allowed to use those things because you are not writing code that, pr that prioritizes readability. Um, and I'm not interested in making it faster for you to write code. right? I am much more interested in prioritizing reading and maintaining code. Right, because those are the things that cost a lot more. And those are the things that are done a lot more. OK, so here we go. Let's jump into some actual C++. That was a lot of slides with a lot of words on it. Actually, I have one more slide with words on it. Um, actually, I have two more slides with words on it before we even see any code. But I'm sorry. Um, so I want to dive into this important distinction here um, that's going to be reused throughout the talk. And it's this distinction between interface sameness and implementation sameness, right? Interface sameness is a mechanism to allow your users of your library, and, and all software we write should be thought of as a library, right? All software has a user, even if it's you, right? Um, so uh, interface sameness in us enables users to treat things the same way in their code. It allows them to create their own sameness, right? Um, Implementation sameness uh, enables readers to understand existing sameness, right? You're not creating sameness here. You are expressing sameness that is there whether you want it to be or not, right? And one way to do it is to copy paste. One way to do it is macros, right? There's all kinds of other ways to express sameness. I'm just saying that the sameness is there whether or not you like it. And there are good ways to express it and there are bad ways to express it. Interface sameness is very difficult, if not impossible, to remove later, right? You can't go change user's code. If the user has been allowed to treat something as the same in their code, then it's the same forever, right? Um, you can, if you control your entire ecosystem, sometimes change things. You can do automated refactoring. You can ship an automated refactoring tool, um, but these things are incredibly, incredibly expensive with respect to software engineering. We do them occasionally at Google, and we have some of the best people in the world at it, and they're still incredibly hard. Um, so be very careful when introducing interface sameness. Implementation sameness is not that, right? Implementation sameness can be changed or removed at any point when it's not helpful, right? If it's not helpful or doesn't add to the readability to express something as the same, then you can express it in two different places. Right? You, can, you can change these things back and forth based on what's more readable. And you don't affect any other code. Right? Um, when interface sameness is done well and, and minimally and correctly, right, you end up with low code coupling, which is this degree of interdependence between software modules. And when you do implementation sameness correctly, you end up with high code cohesion. So this is a long, old uh, topic in software engineering, right? This concept of low code coupling plus high code cohesion makes good software. And so the, the cohesion comes from implementation sameness, and the coupling comes from interface sameness. And if you have too much interface sameness, you end up with too much code coupling, and you end up with difficult to maintain or difficult to evolve software. 
Don't repeat yourself. This is a really popular one lately, and I see it misused all the time. I've seen people say that wet is the opposite of dry, and they say wet is we enjoy typing. And you already know what I think about typing, right? You already know what I think about reducing typing. I don't care. I really don't care if it takes you more time to type something. Um, and notice there's nothing in here about typing or reducing the size of your code or anything like that, right? This is the kind of where the dry principle came from, is this book, The Practical Programmer. Every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, and authoritative representation within a system, right? So let's think through that principle as we go through this. I'm going to say typing again because I, I want to drive home this point. Dry programming isn't always about typing less. Here we have like a typical example of interacting with a, um, interacting with a C library, right? Where we have like some C connection, it's, uh, you know, we're modifying something, so we have to pass it in and we have an error code returned. And like, this is awful, don't get me wrong. But when you're incrementally evolving things, sometimes you change one thing at a time. Maybe the first thing to change here is to look at this, right? We have repeated code here. Code less than zero, code less than zero in both of these places. This is implementation data, right? There is an operation happening that isn't expressed. And, and maybe the better way to say that is has error status. And we have to actually implement this function off somewhere, right? And this is like typically given as the top half of this example as like an example for how to name things better in code, how to not say things with documentation. But this is also don't repeat yourself, right? We are not repeating this little snippet of logic. But we've typed more. We've typed a lot more, right? Um, and uh, don't repeat yourself also can be as simple as creating a function with a descriptive name, right? We don't need fancy templates. We don't need CRTP. We don't need concepts all the time to do this. In C code, if you're constrained to writing C code, you can still be expressive, right? Sometimes all you need is a function. Um, and, and like I said, dry is closely connected to other best coding best practices, right? Like, like saying things with code rather than saying things with documentation. So let's, let's actually finally do some C++. This wasn't C++, this was like C. But <laughs> let's finally talk about some C++. And we'll start with the most basic. This is not modern C++. This is classic C++, right? This is what you learn in your intro course. When you first learn about classes, you learn you can have a base class, usually you use animals or shapes or something like that, something cheesy um, because it fits on slides. And you have like a cow that says moo, you have a pig that says oink, you have a horse that says nay. I know that like animal sounds are actually different in different languages, although I recently learned that most of these are the same in Hebrew, so interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and you can put them all into one container, right? And then you can like make your whole barnyard speak, right? Um, and, and this is this is happens in the calling code, right? This is interface sameness. This is allowing the user of our types to take advantage of sameness. Um, traditional polymorphism can all also be used for uh, implementation sameness, right? You can put some common implementation in here. Right? But it's, it's very difficult to decouple traditional polymorphism from interface sameness. Let's talk about templates. Templates, also, I am going to say something controversial, not modern C++. If you're not using templates at this point, and if you think templates are modern, then I've got news for you. <laughs> um, and the news is the rest of this talk. Uh, vector, right? Vector is a template. Uh, a vector of int, vector of strings, right? The code for vector of int and vector of string is the same, right? It's the same lines of source code for those two things. This is implementation sameness. It also has some interface sameness. Most, most of it is interface sameness, right? The thing that you get out gets used differently. But other than that, like the access to the elements of the vector, the containery nature of vector is the same. Right, it's an interface, interface sameness. And we can take advantage of that interface sameness to write uh, functions or function templates um, that share code, right? That express sameness. But we don't always have to. We can actually 
um, take advantage of our implementation sameness in vector to add to the interface of something, right? So this is a, a bit of a stretch, and I'm going to walk back this stretch in a second, but it fits in the slide better. Um, and that is like a, a function call can be, a free function can be part of the non-intrusive interface of something. So I would argue here that handle disturbance, if it's part of your library, is part of the non-intrusive interface of vector of unique pointer of animal, right? And we have created um, something that is not part of the non-intrusive interface of vector event. So in other words, we've introduced interface difference while maintaining implementation sameness. Does this make sense? I'm going to mostly take questions at the end because I have a lot of things I want to say and I'm really excited. Um, but if things are like wildly not making sense, just wave at me or something. Um, I know it's also into the conference and everyone's tired. So, um, so here's the, the more common case, right? Usually we think of interfaces as intrusive, especially in traditional object-oriented uh, languages, but it's the same thing here, right? We, we are reusing implementation via a, a member, right? And we have different interface. But I have a question here, and that is that like, when, I, when I show these two things alongside each other, right? this canvas is like got shapes in it or something like that. It's the, the other classic example of uh, C++ 101 um, polymorphism. right? You have shapes and triangles and squares and things like that that inherit from shape, and you can maybe get the area or something like that. So the question I have is like, what's, what's the dot, 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 right? Like we're all kind of, as software engineers, looking at that, and we kind of pretty much have vaguely the same thing filled into that dot, dot, dot in our minds, right? It's, it's something like, uh, it's a, an owning collection of things, and we have like a, maybe an insert and a remove and a contain and a remove if, right? And it's, it's very possible that if these two things existed in a code base together in the same module, right? We're not talking about across libraries, we're talking about sameness within your implementation, it's entirely possible that we would repeat ourselves, right? We would have implementations of all these in both of these classes. Um, and uh, so one way we could take advantage of this implementation sameness without like repeating ourselves would be to just, um, to just expose the vector to the user. Now, if you've been in software engineering for any amount of time, you should have alarm bells going off here, right? Why is this bad? We could probably list off 10 to 20 reasons why this is bad, but like, one of them is that it leaks implementation details into the inter in the interface, right? The fact that we use a vector to store these things is not necessarily inherent to the idea of a barnyard, right? A barnyard is not necessarily ordered. We may choose to not order this later, but once we've leaked this vector here, right, our users can do anything with it. And they can depend on it being ordered. Right? There's this thing called Hiram's Law, which is that anything that's implicit in your interface will be used in a large enough system of software. I quoted that not quite right. But it's, it's basic, the basic idea is that. right? And um, we're not being restricted enough, restrictive enough also, right? We're allow allowing the user to rely on certain things. Um, we're allowing the user to change things that we own uh, willy-nilly, right? We may as well just make shapes a public data member. We may as well make animals a public data member if we're going to do this, right? And we're still not even expressing all the aspects of sameness here, right? We're not expressing the fact that this, these two share this as attribute of owning some polymorphic base, right? They have a, a collection of things that they own. Um, so let's talk about some mechanisms for doing this better. Um, and we're going to get into mixins here, which is one of, my, one of my favorite things to talk about in C++, to be honest. Um, I have a lot of favorite things, but this is, <laughs> this is, this is one of them, right? Um, so we, we had this like, conceptual thing that we all thought about that was in common between these two. We, like, it was an owning collection of things, right? And, and how do we usually spell like of things in C++? Well, we usually use templates, right? So that we'd have a class template that is like owning collection of things, right? That's, that's really almost how you'd read that in your mind. And so we can use inheritance in a way that they don't usually teach you about 
in intro to C++ to kind of include this common code in the class, right? It's, it's, it's including it in the implementation. Um, conceptually, actually, the thing that the compiler does is, is essentially to put this um, type as the first member. Like, its data is stamped out into the, the class's representation, right? And the, the methods are accessible with the same, with the, the uh, privileges that you specify here, right? But we have the differences and the sameness expressed here, right? And, and here's where we actually put the implementation of the things that are the same. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but I also want to point out that like, we can have implementation sameness without introducing any interface sameness here, right? This is a protected method that's going to be used in the implementations here, but we are extracting the part that's in common between this handle disturbance and total area, right? And the part that's in common is iterating over the collection. And we're expressing the part that's in common between these two things in a common location. Um, and that's really important for readability, maintainability of code. So uh, this is usually called a mix-in. Um, this is how they're implemented in C++. A number of other languages have much, much better ways to implement mix-ins. And we're going to get to that and things that we're missing in, in a little bit. Um, but in this case, we're introducing some interface sameness, like I said, right? We're mixing in a public method that's insert, right? Um, and the reuse of names here is, is a feature in some cases if you use it carefully, right? Because we are reducing cognitive load. The, the names meaning the same thing in these two different places is reusing the work that was done to learn what that name means. It's kind of a subtle way of saying it, but the, the point is that like, the fact that we were able to reuse things, now we can't take this too far. You can end up with coupling pretty easily, right? But we actually have controlled over, uh, control, we have maintained some control over code coupling in a really subtle way here, right? We have an owning collection of animal, and that type is unrelated to an owning collection of shape. Now we can use a template to generalize over those two, but we can use templates to generalize over anything, right? So that's not, it's not like we've created an inherent connection between these two things. We've only created a connection insofar as the implementation is the same, not the interface is the same. Um, let's talk about more uses for mix-ins before we come back to our, our cows and our horses and, and our triangles. Um, and what's the same about these two types? Right? What if we go to implement comparators for these? Right? We, have, we, we would do something like this. Right? We'd have an equals, we have a not equals. In pre C20, I know everyone wants to jump on to me and say, oh, we can do better than this now. In pre C20, what, what are we going to do here? Right? We're going to do something like this, and we have a dot, that dot that we can all fill in. Right? There might be a less than, there might be a greater than. They're, they're all going to be pretty much the same thing, though, right? Um, and we're doing the same thing over here. Right? This is a kind of sameness that's not necessarily textual sameness, but it's very conceptual sameness, and we want to be able to express that in code. Right? We don't want someone have to have to expect that you know, we're going down the line of elements everywhere and have to like, go eye chart test one after another. Right? This is an easy way to introduce subtle bugs into code. It's an easy way to make code very difficult to maintain, and you're repeating yourself in a, a way that's not necessarily textual, right? Uh, the, the, the sameness that's not expressed here is element-wise comparison, right? So this is actually the classic use for mix-ins. And, and if you were to look these things up on, like, you know, if you were to Google for C++ mix-in, right, you'd probably get something like this. You'd probably get um, a hidden friend, which I'm not going to go into what that means, but it's, it's a, a friend function um, that um, Marshall's looking at me like I misused the term hidden friend. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> it's close. Anyway, the, the point is that uh, it, is, it is introducing a friend function definition, right, based on the, the type that we are templating on, right? And so then we can mix in these definitions into both uh, foo and bar to add these functions, the equals, the not equals, et cetera, right? Um, this is called Curiously Recurring Template Pattern. I love CRTP. Um, 
I love to talk about CRTP. We're going to talk about CRTP a lot here, and we're going to talk about why it's not going away. Um, and hopefully, I will convince you all of that. Um, I think there will be some people very skeptical, but that's OK. Um, the elements member function is something that's sometimes called a, a customization point. Right? We're going to talk a lot about customization point design also. Um, but it's basically a, a minimal expression of the differences between the two uh, types, right? It, is a, it, it enables the expression of sameness, right? So we, we actually are calling into this customization point in the middle of our sameness, right? Our sameness is not only uh, at the entry point of the function, but it is also mixed into the function itself, right? And here are the differences are actually expressed in terms of customization points. Um, so that's a really important point of a really important, relatively succinct. Uh, sorry, I'm. It's <laughs> relatively succinct uh, expression of what a customization point is. Right? It's the the differences in the midst that that enable the expression of sameness. Um, we can reuse customization points, right? So this customization point elements um, could express multiple unrelated types of sameness, right? If we wanted to be able to print the elements, right, we could get our elements uh, and we can loop over them. Um, this is probably not something you're used to seeing for loop over, and I um, would explain it except for like, you can look up basically any talk I've done in the past like two years, and it's going to be something silly with these dot, dot, dots that will hopefully help you understand this. So I'm not going to go into that, because this is a software engineering talk and not a programming talk. But basically, yeah, we can, we can write something that prints out all the elements, right? Because we have this succinct expression of the uh, sameness and the succinct expression of the differences, right? Um, and, and all we have to do to add printability to comparability is add one more mix in, right? Um, but this is something I want you to be very careful about when you do this, right? Be very careful of code coupling, right? Um, when in doubt, use a different name for your customization point for a different mix in, right? And you can always forward to the same implementation. But if you think that these things will ever be different, right, in any way, like, because once your customization point is the same, Everything that uses it is coupled. So I'm going to say that again, because I think that's really important. Once you have a customization point defined that is the same, everything that uses that customization point is coupled via the customization point. right? And so we need to be very careful with what we couple to what when we do these things. But uh, in this case, I think this is probably pretty safe, because the the aspect of sameness is still element-wise, right? And that's, that's pretty consistent across these two aspects of element-wise behavior. All right, mix-in, mix-ins. Let's talk about this weird line of code that if you've never done CRTP, you've probably, this looks really funny. And if you've done CRTP a lot, you're like, oh, of course. Um, you probably read this like as all one token, basically. Um, so this is a downcast, right, that we can do because we, uh, in this base class, right, we know that we are a foo, because foo told us that we are a foo, right? You do have to be careful about this. You, there are ways to check this, right? There are ways to get tools to check this. There are ways to trick your code into checking this. Um, you can use a, a safe static cast here that uh, does dynamic cast. Um, in debug mode and, and static cast in release mode, for instance. Uh, there are a number of ways to, to, to check this. So you do have to be careful. Um, and you are repeating yourself, in a sense, right? So you would think this is bad, but I'm going to talk about why I think it's still pretty good. Uh, anyway, um, but this, this is pretty arcane, right? Uh, but it's a common pattern. Uh, so let's say it with code, right? We can create a mixin that defines how mixins work. We can, when we have a typical CRTP base, we can mix in the behavior of downcasting. And so now we have this printable element wise. I'll let you parse that for a second, but basically we've, we've partially specialized a template on a template template. Don't worry, I said template template. I didn't say it three times. Cthulhu won't appear. Um, uh, yeah, 
anyway, uh, we, we, you know, we have a template template that we're matching here, basically, to get a name for this, right? And we're saying that things that are using this pattern should work this way, right? And, and they should be able to, to downcast to derive through a function. This can be a, a member function. This can be const eval. This is zero runtime cost. If you're really concerned, you can say const eval force inline. Um, don't, because compilers are smart enough. But uh, if you are concerned, I mean, if you are concerned, benchmark it and show me that it's actually having cost, and, and um, I will be very interested. But anyway, um, so yeah, and so now we have our mix-in. The, the um, sameness in our mix-in pattern expressed with a mix-in. Um, and now all we have to do is say self.elements, which I think is a lot more readable. Let's talk about C++ 23's deducing this, which there's been several people watching this on YouTube, screaming it at the screen for the past uh, three minutes. Um, I wanted to go through CRTP first, uh, because a lot of people in this room won't use C++ 23 until 2030. Um, so there's still definitely benefit in learning that. I think there's still definitely benefit in understanding the value that it provides. And, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But we have this new syntax in C++23 um, that allows us to deduce uh, the type of this, right? Um, and that allows us to just use this as, directly, right? And so this, will, this, this is a template, right? It says it's got auto here, right? So that makes it a template. Um, and this will deduce the type foo when you call this with an object of type foo. Right? In this case, it's going to do, deduce a const reference to foo. Um, and uh, then we can just use that. Right? Um, and now, look, we don't have CRTP. We got rid of it. We don't have to repeat ourselves with foo. What's wrong with this? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the different types of sameness we've been talking about for this whole talk. Yeah, we've introduced inheritance, exactly. Right? We are mixing interface sameness with implementation sameness. And I think so many people are missing, so many people on the C++ committee are missing this downside of deducing this. I think even if you're using deducing this, which you probably should in this case, there is value to parameterizing your base on the type that you're mixing into. Because you are no longer, you are, once you do, have done that, you are no longer introducing interface sameness implicitly, right? And, and you're tempted when you don't have this parameter in the base. You're tempted to try and do this. This, of course, doesn't compile because compilers aren't magic and they can't just figure things out like this. But um, it doesn't compile for very confusing reasons, right? You can't really tell from this that, that this is actually a member of this class. Right? That doesn't, that's not something people are used to. And so it's very tempting to try and introduce interface sameness and later find out, um, or to utilize this interface sameness, and later find out that it's, it's not the interface sameness that you thought. So that's all I'm going to say about CRTP. The death of CRTP has been way overstated. I, I do want people to think critically about the advantages that deducing this gives us, which we should still be using. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Um, but the accidental interface sameness that it can introduce. Um, so what other forms of sameness do we have here? Uh, well, there's a really interesting one that you can see just within this, right? We have x, y, and z, and we're repeating x, y, and z here. And actually, we're also repeating the types here, right? We're repeating them via auto, so that saves us a lot. But we are repeating these three lines here. Right? Um, and in general, this sort of sameness requires reflection. Um, there's going to be a theme of this talk that is requires reflection. Um, there are ways to get around this for plain structs like this. Um, look at, for instance, uh, Andy Sofer's C++ Now talk from this year is actually phenomenal on this. My C++ North talk from last year goes into this in a little more detail as to the actual mechanism for it. And I think it's actually very interesting. There's a trick you can use for this. 
But it doesn't solve the general problem, right? The general problem of having to repeat the data members in, um, in, a, in some form like this in order to extract that information. C++ needs this really badly. We are introducing sameness that's hard to back out all over our code. It's hard to maintain because of that, right? Um, and here's an example of one of our piecemeal meal ways of addressing that. Um, we have in C++20, we have this language level mix-in. And I bet none of you ever thought of it as a language level mix-in. But what's really happening here is that it's a mix-in specifically for the case of comparison, right? It specifically mixes in the compar comparison operators. So we're adding reflection to C++ piecewise. And this is not sustainable, right? This is something we need to take a very hard look at as a C++ committee. Um, these uh, piecewise fixes for things that are missing from reflection are adding a lot of cognitive load, right? I bet most of you never thought of this as a mix-in, but if we had the reflection and reification mechanisms in the language to create mix-ins, this could just be a library feature, right? This would have just been a library feature. We wouldn't necessarily have introduced special syntax for it, and we'd all just be thinking of it as a, of it as a special case of how mix-ins work. And instead, we are thinking of it as a special thing that does a special thing. Right? We've introduced extra cognitive load that's not reusable. Uh, what's my time like? I have a couple of really cool things to go into, and I'm, I'm ah, I'll go for it. We can do this. OK. Qualifier forwarding. A qualifier forwarding is another interesting type of sameness. I'm going to go a little bit faster here, and this is more targeting kind of intermediate levels. Of <laughs> Somebody laughed at me saying I'm going faster. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is more targeting a kind of intermediate level programmer who's already inter interacted with this before, so I'm not going to explain everything. Um, as I start to get more and more advanced, I'm trying to have something for every level here. Um, so perfect forwarding. Um, if you are part of the audience that I'm addressing right now, you've probably seen before uh, since C++11, right? We have this, this uh, tref ref is called a forwarding reference, or originally it was called a universal reference before we realized that that was a terrible term um, because it's only ever used for forwarding or should only ever be used for forwarding. Um, and it has to be exactly that way. Otherwise, uh, it won't deduce the referenceness as part of T. Um, this is equivalent to, right, this is expressing a sameness that is equivalent to a tref version and a tref ref version, but the R value version is harder to write. Does anyone know off the top of your head how to write this other than Marshall and Nevin? <laughs> no, uh, concepts will deduce um, forwarding references. You actually have to do something like this. You have to make this trivial uh, alias template, and then you have to use it. And now, because this is not exactly trefref, it will not deduce a forwarding reference. So this happens occasionally, um, but not very often. But these are the two things that are the same here, right? Um, qualifier forwarding in member functions. Let's jump back to our owning collection, right? Um, our, our horses and pigs and triangles example from earlier, right? We have this for each um, that's part of our implementation sameness. But actually, I'm, I'm kind of shortcutting here, right? We're missing something. We're missing a, a non-const overload here, right? So we have to repeat ourselves, or we have to forward to some other underlying function or something like that. But there's still a lot of repeated code here, right? Um, and if we actually want to be thorough, not that thorough, not standard library thorough, but like normal use case thorough, um, we need three. If we wanted to be standard library thorough, we need like 15, because um, you need all the combinations of const and volatile, but we're not being standard library thorough, and, and you shouldn't be unless you are a standard library implementer. Um, but qualifier forwarding uh, causes us to repeat ourselves a lot. Uh, C++ deducing this, makes this a lot easier. And this is one of the, there were a couple of papers that were combined into deducing this. And one of them was this. And the other one was the one that removed some of this, these uh, 
that was useful for CRTP, and we realized that the same mechanism could solve this problem. And, and in, in C23, we can actually do this, right? We can use a forwarding reference in the deducing, in, in the this parameter of the method, right? And then we can forward like this, like forward like the this parameter or forward like self. So this forward like was added in C23. Um, you'll notice that I, 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 I kind of hand waved here a little bit. Um, we don't actually have the type trait version of this. I would have had to have done like a decal type or would have had to do a requires requires. And I didn't want to do that here, but so it's a missing thing to note. Um, somebody can tell me afterwards if that's headed for 26 or if we just missed it. Um, but std forward like uh, will copy the reference and uh, CV qualifiers, const volatile qualifiers, to the argument, right? Um, and that's powerful here, right? Because now we've expressed all three of these in the same place. We've expressed the sameness here without having to copy paste. Let's talk about name forwarding. Name forwarding is um, the same kind of thing. And it's, uh, in, who's, used a, who's used a language with name forwarding before? Who's written Ruby code before? No one in here has written Ruby? Oh, there's one person. Awesome. I guess I'm asking the wrong people. C++ programmers don't write a lot of Ruby. I would encourage you, as a C++ programmer, to write a lot of code in a lot of other languages. Um, it is uh, incredibly helpful for understanding what things are doing in C++, even though we don't have first class mechanisms for them. Um, name forwarding is something that you're allowed to do in Ruby through reflection and reification, which we don't have. Um, that allows us to, so, so let's go, go back to our owning collection right here, right? And we basically have a lot of these um, methods that basically just pass through to the underlying implementation, right? We have a clear, we have a size, we have a swap that will swap all of the elements out, right? With things in another thing. We have insert, which basically just forwards to push back, um, right? And uh, this is like a straw man syntax. I'm not proposing this, this is just to the standard. Um, the amount of effort that it would take to get something like this as a one of feature into the standard without reflection is enormous. Um, so if you're thinking of it, proposing it to the standard, you will likely get told, wait for reflection or something, um, which is annoying, but I understand why that, that's the answer you'd get. Um, and, and basically, we want to be able to say something like this, right? We want to say that clear size swap um, insert as pushback, all do uh, basically forward to this member, right? They do the same thing, but on this member. And sometimes you can have multiple members in a type and you can have multiple uh, names forwarded that way, right? Um, why is this better than exposing vector directly to the user? What did you say? Encapsulation, perfect. That's actually a better word than I was going to even use, right? Is I was going to say restricted interface, but it's basically the same thing, right? We still maintain control over the name. So the calling code uses the name. We can customize it at any point in the future. But until then, we are still expressing what that customization is to the person reading our implementation. And I think that's really important here. Um, this would be pretty easy to build on top of relatively basic reflection and reification. We don't need a whole lot to make this work. Um, Ruby and Python have this as a library feature. Um, this is also important because it reuses understanding and propagates code changes, right? So if I add overloads to uh, swap, for instance, it propagates those extra overloads because we're forwarding the name, not necessarily the overloads. And you can do that by using variadic templates and perfect forwarding, right? But it's, it's arcane, and it's not very specific, and it doesn't actually expose like, things like documentation forwarding. It's not clear to a documentation generator right, that this is doing the same thing for something else.
the, yeah, this is a straw man syntax, right? The idea here, yeah, probably public forward would be a better name for it, or forward as public, or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, you're right, absolutely. Um, all right, so don't repeat yourself. I might go over by a few minutes, and I'm really sorry. Um, Yeah, you might want to forward as protected. You might want to have options here, right? That's, that's absolutely a reasonable thing to, to, to want to do. And if we had metaprogramming, all that would, uh, sorry, if we had reflection and reification, all we'd need to do is add a library feature for that or add an argument, right? Like, um, so this is not like, yeah, we need reflection. I think it's pretty clear to the, to, by the way, I think it's pretty clear to the committee that we need reflection. I'm not saying anything new here. We need someone to do the work to actually specify what we need from reflection. And that's a very different prospect, because specifying reflection in the world's worst programming language, which is called standard ease, C++ standard ease, um, is really hard. Really, really hard. Um, you're, you're writing, yeah, I don't even want to get there, but go there. But all right, let's go back to don't repeat yourself. Um, I specifically want it to, to jump into this, like dive into this single unambiguous authoritative representation here. So uh, every piece of knowledge, I totally highlighted the part that I was just about, <laughs> that I was not gonna jump into, awesome. Uh, every piece of knowledge. So what are some other pieces of knowledge here? And I kind of alluded to this earlier, right? We have ownership as a separable piece of knowledge. Uh, in this abstraction that we have, right? Um, and again, these are hand wavy examples. This is slide code. We don't really have the space to show the advantages of this kind of thing. But ownership um, and the fact that it's a collection are potentially separable, right? They're not necessarily worth separating. That's a different discussion, but they are potentially separable. So let's talk about what a mechanism for separating them might look like. And this is a, this is a typical pattern in the standard library. Many of you will recognize it from allocators, right? You have a, this, this class template customization point. Again, only said template twice, no Cthulhu, we're good. Um, but what else could owner be here, right? Owner could be shared pointer, it's still pretty reasonable. Um, owner could be a small buffer optimization, a number of other things, right? We can use shared pointer here um, instead of unique pointer without changing semantics if we wanted to just because um, copy semantics are more general than move semantics, right? So in general, we, we have some generalization we could do here, but we have a reasonable default also, right? If this is not something that we need to customize, we have a reasonable default. This can easily be taken too far. This is like premature generalization. I've heard people say premature generalization is the root of all evil. That's not necessarily true, and that's kind of making a straw man of what's going on here, but you do have to be careful with it, right? This is not necessarily premature generalization. This is expressing the intent of a particular uh, piece of code, right? We're expressing the fact that unique pointer is the ownership mechanism here. It's like back, way back at the beginning of the talk where we named something like check for error, right? Check code for error. We are naming something owner here to express the fact that unique pointer is our mechanism for expressing ownership. Now, unique pointer in this case is pretty much always used for expressing ownership. But still, uh, there are other methods of expressing ownership that are not necessarily heap allocating, right? Um, good customization point design takes a career to learn. Like, legitimately, I have had the immense honor of like working directly with Eric Niebler, who's probably one of the best in the world at customization point design on, on several different papers. And I still get it wrong sometimes. The committee as a whole gets it wrong all the time. We've learned a lot. I think I'm gonna, I, I hope I will convince you of a place that you have used before uh, where the committee got this totally wrong. Um, and we're gonna dive into that now-ish. Um, std vector. Uh, std vector is not the place where we got this wrong. Um, to be clear, but this is an example of this kind of thing in the standard library, right? We have this allocator customization point, which I, I actually am, was surprised to learn is not super common knowledge. Somebody asked me earlier today, hey, I'm, or yesterday, I'm an embedded programmer. 
can I use vector without heap allocation? And I was like, yeah, actually, if you use a bump allocator in the allocator, and they were like, wait, 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 wait the allocator customization point, what do you, what do you mean by that? Um, so this is definitely, I'm not going to go deep into what allocators are. Um, I'm going to go shallowly into what allocators are. Um, but if you need to go deep on allocators, there are a lot of great talks out there on that. Um, and they are incredibly useful, especially for embedded spaces. Um, so the expandable container with contiguous storage, piece of knowledge, right, this, this std vector part, is separable from how that storage is created. And there is a reasonable default for how to do that, right, heap allocation, but it is, it is separable from the fact that it is a container with contiguous storage. We can go one step further, though, right? std q and uh, std stack, uh, the semantics of a queue itself is separable from the way that the items in the queue are stored. And this is actually a layering of customization points that you probably didn't even notice, right? Because uh, queue is separable from the way that the items are stored, and the way that the items are stored is the way that is separable from the way that they're allocated, right? So we have a chaining of customization points here. And we, the, the complexity is as complex as it needs to be and not more. And that's really important here. All right, let's talk about another customization point, unique pointer. Um, the unique pointer, the unique ownership piece of knowledge is separable from how that memory and even the object itself is created or destroyed, right? Where's the allocation and creation portion of this customization? Anyone want to shout it out? The operator of you? Uh, no, actually, it's at the construction site. Uh, so close. You could customize new here, but most people don't. Most people will actually um, use, for instance, use stack memory, right? Use stack memory directly. You can also create the memory some other way, right? You could use alloc and then a cast and an assignment and all kinds of other stuff and get into all kinds of undefined behavior. But the, the point is that, right, um, the customization of the creation of the memory and the allocation is done at the construction site. Um, and the destruction is the only part that actually sticks with the pointer for its lifetime. Usually we use make unique here, right? That's the, the general recommendation. And that's because we don't need any special customization of the construction, right? Let's go down this rabbit hole. Um, so this is a signature. Does anything feel off here? I'll give you a hint. It's a difference between the last two slides. And if you noticed this before now, then you're ahead of me, because I didn't notice this until I was making the presentation. Um, this design isolates the piece of knowledge that needs to persist for the lifetime of the, no the object, right? The deleter, um, sort of. It actually also, um, you can customize the pointer type and do something like this with a restrict. And I'm not going to get into that, but it doesn't really isolate it. Um, but the other question is, like, are these separable pieces of knowledge in the first place? In the standard library, are allocation and destruction things that are usually separated? Exactly, right? So some of you are catching on to where I'm going. So let's, let's, let's step back for a second. Where did we get this term separable? Where well, we started with every piece of knowledge, and somehow we kind of intuitively started discussing this, and, and all, uh, like, even when I discussed the slides with people, we started throwing in this word separable. But like, we don't necessarily say that things are separated just because they can be. Right? That's not what dry is about. Dry is about having a single, unambiguous, and authoritative representation. It can combine things if it is reasonable to combine them, right? and if that reduces cognitive load, and there are not necessarily reasons to separate things, then it can combine things. It just has to be unambiguous and authoritative. Um, so let's think through this. When you're kind of stuck on a design or something feels wrong, let's look, you look at analogous situations, right? So why would you do that, right? Well, reducing cognitive load, because if you can see an analogy, then potentially your, the reader of the code or the user of your library can see the analogy also, right? And they can reuse the cognitive load that they um, took on to learn the first thing in order to, 
to understand the second thing, right? Uh, but also don't repeat yourself. You might find something that you can reuse there. Uh, what's the most analogous standard library class template to unique pointer? This is an easy question, freebie. Shared pointer, all right. Somebody should have been snarky and said auto pointer. I would have loved it. Um, Nevin, you missed your cue. <laughs> so uh, cbbreference.org, which is not authoritative, but generally is pretty good, says that every standard library component that may need to allocate or release storage from string to vector to shared pointer does so through an allocator. So allocating and releasing storage are not separable pieces of knowledge in the standard library. The authoritative representation for allocation and, and destruction of storage in the standard library is the allocator abstraction, right? Um, I'm like reading my bullet points on my slides, and I hate that, but I think I, I, I want to say this very clearly, right? That like there's an authoritative representation, and unique pointer doesn't use it, and that's a problem, right? Um, fortunately, uh, so unique pointer is, is broken. It doesn't use the authoritative representation. So fortunately, shared pointer uses allocators. Wait, wait a second. This is a constructor of shared pointer. <laughs> it uses a deleter and an allocator. What in the world is going on here? Shared pointer is kind of more broken in its constructor. Um, we have two options for destroying things. We could, um, or for deleting things, we could call the deleter, or we could call destroy and then deallocate on the allocator, right? And there's no way to know that from this, this signature, which one gets used. You have, to go into the, you have to go into the documentation and understand. And actually, even once you go into the documentation and understand, you probably don't understand what's going on, because I didn't at first until I actually went and read the standard library code, um, which is not something you should have to do. Um, but uh, yeah, these are not used for the object itself. Who knows what they're used for? Uh, I would say other than Marshall, but I know Marshall's dying to say it. The control block, awesome. Yes. Awesome. Okay, I don't, I don't use shared pointers much, so I don't know how much people know about shared pointers. Like, I kind of vaguely know that there's a control block, and I know that there's like contiguous storage allocated and stuff, but. So yeah, allocate shared to the rescue, right? Allocate shared actually, fortunately, we have uh, allocate shared that takes this, this, this constructor. And I think we kind of intuitively knew that we had messed something up, right? And uh, from CBB reference again, we have, unlike shared pointer constructors, allocate shared does not accept a separate custom deleter. Um, the supplied allocator is used for destruction. I see the 10 minutes, thank you. Um, I might use five more. I apologize. <laughs> um, I hate it when the last keynote goes over, so I'm really sorry. But I, have, I promise you I'll make it worth your while. Um, it, so it doesn't use a, a separate custom deleter. Instead, it uses the allocator for the destruction of the control block and the object. Woohoo! Right? Like, this is, this, is, this is the right abstraction. Right? So we have an easy way to be consistent. Use make shared when we don't need to customize either allocation or deletion and use allocate shared when we use, need to customize either of those, um, or both. And don't use shared pointer constructors, basically, is, is the advice there, right? And that's kind of the advice we'd already heard, right? We already hear this with make shared, and, and allocate shared is, is just a slight extension to that. So why don't we have allocate unique? Well, we go back to the paper on make unique. There's a discussion of this. And there are several reasons, one of them being the fact that like, there's um, not uh, a control block in a uh, unique pointer, and so we don't need to like, hook into something special. But uh, one of the most convincing reasons here is that um, there's no syntax to adapt an allocator to deleter. Right? Returning unique pointer of t unspecified would be inconvenient for users. This is unlike allocate shared, because shared pointer uses type erasure, right? And so we don't actually have to name that type. But we have to name the type in the case of unique pointer. So I mean, this was, for me, when I looked this up after writing the rest of these slides, I was like, wow, we're like actually admitting that we messed up here. And, and if we go even further, we, we 
find in that paper, this is from STL, this is back like so old that we were having in numbered papers and not p numbered papers, but, um, and this is like a text file, um, which is an acceptable way to submit a paper to the committee, but not done very often anymore. Um, and the proposal recommends against allocate unique. Um, but one way we, it says one way that we could provide it in the future without introducing a wrapper class would be to say that a uh, unique pointer, if it's not a deleter, then it should be an allocator. So like we, we're admitting that, hey, maybe this should have been an allocator in the first place, right? Uh, it's not quite what's being admitted there, um, but I took that as pretty validating of my analysis, at least of this. All right, end of the unique pointer rabbit hole. I hope that I've really introduced enough uh, about how customization points work, how sameness is expressed in C++, how interface and implementation sameness differ, that that all made sense. Um, I want to talk about one more thing that people have been dying to hear, um, and then I'll take some quick questions. But one of them is uh, concepts. Where do concepts fit into this interface and implementation sameness, right? C++ 20 concepts are really dangerous with respect to this. C++ 20 concepts allow users to extract interface sameness without your permission, right? Like, let me say that again. C++ 20 concepts allow users to extract interface sameness without your permission, right? They allow users to couple your code even if you did your very best to prevent it. That's terrifying. It should be terrifying if I've done a good job of introducing the talk so far. That should be terrifying to most people in this room, right? So consider this case, right? Concepts can couple things based only on names. Well, we have a container that, like, some special container that, like, um, returns a bool as to whether or not it cleared something, right? Maybe it's an atomic container or something. And we have a, a color that returns true if opacity is zero. And we have some function that does a thing. And all we said about that function is that it has to have a clear that returns convertible to bool. And right inside here, all hell breaks loose, right? And it's not, like, it's not very likely that we're going to end up with this compiling and working, but it is entirely possible that this could compile and work and choose the wrong overload because it's a preferred overload because you've got some reference qualifier or something wrong somewhere, and be in real code running for, for you know, years before you notice it. Right? Um, this could be the source of all kinds of problems because you chose something from a different library on accident. Um, and concept checks don't check namespaces generally, right? Concept checks check for na intrusive names. Like, there's no way to put a namespace on this clear when you're checking for it. So be very careful with concepts and be very expressive. I think this is one of the reasons why people are saying that requires requires is an anti-pattern. And you should generally have a named concept, because you should take more than one name to qualify a function template. Um, so I think that that's something that's very important to say here. And it's part of the reason why I didn't talk about concepts in the, in the context of sameness all that much, right? Because they are terrifying for large-scale software. I think they're great for like small things and fun things and very ridiculously generic libraries like ranges but I think that they're terrifying for large-scale uh, software engineering. So um, more tools for expressing sameness that I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, normal functions, I mentioned it. Bonus, these work in C. Um, macros and code generation, yeah, they're gross, but sometimes they're better than repeating things, right? Having to go through and update something in 10 different places is still worse than um, writing a macro, in my opinion. Just don't go crazy with it, right? Just like you can with template metaprogramming, you can go crazy and actually reduce the readability of the code. So you're always focused on readability when you're doing these things. But readability and maintainability can be balanced with macros sometimes. And some very good pieces of software use macros a lot. Clang uses macros all over the place in its implementation. Uh, Carbon, the, the new language being written, developed it, as a cross company effort, but primarily at Google, the current Carbon compiler uses macros all over the place, uses some code generation. Google uses code generation all over the place also for, for protobufs, right? Like this is, they're really smart people who use code generation. So don't just say gross and throw it out. 
Uh, customization point objects, I would have loved to get into that. There's like, it's a whole talk on customization point objects I'd love to give some time. Type erasure, there's really fun things to do about type, with type erasure. There was a great talk earlier on type erasure. I apologize for not knowing the name of the person who gave it, but um, type erasing uh, functions, uh, virtual functions. Um, const expr functions, so const expr functions express the sameness of compile time and runtime implementation, right? Const expr on a function means like maybe this will be called at compile time, maybe this will be called at runtime. And, and that's a type of sameness that I didn't get to talk about. Uh, dependency injection, which is awesome in a number of languages. It can be overused in some languages if you've ever worked in a language that has dependency injection, you know what I'm talking about. Missing from C++ needs reflection. Aspect-oriented programming, same kind of thing, can be overused. Missing from C++ needs reflection. Uh, decorators, decoration um, is a tool for all kinds of things and expresses all kinds of these patterns. It's a mechanism for expressing a lot of these patterns. Missing from C++ needs reflection. You get the idea. Um, a lot of things, a lot of tools for expressing sameness, this talk could be very different in five years. And I really hope it is. Um, thanks, and I'll take a few questions. And then I have one more thing to say after that. So I have one more like three minute thing to say after this, but I'll take a couple of questions if people have uh, time. I know I'm over by five minutes. Um, and I totally understand if you like have to catch a bus or anything. Does somebody, anyone have a question? Oh yeah, there's a mic down here too. Question. Yeah, that is, so that is true, except for the fact that you would have caught it a lot earlier, right? Because you would have, if that template is that generic, right, and is, is, is completely unconstrained, then anything that goes to that is going to be the best match. But now it's going to be surprising things that are going to be the best match. And you may not discover them until much later, right? So if you were writing that before, then, so if you're writing this code before, right, before concepts, do the thing. Right? If this is in your library somewhere, and you're somehow picking up on this name, then you're going to have all kinds of mismatches long before this. Right? Um, so this, this constraint gives you an artificial sense of security that that's, causes the actual problem. Right. So if this is unconstrained template parameter, right? then do the thing is going to match, like assume do the thing is a more common name for something, right? It's going to match any object you would call this on, any object you would overload anywhere, right? And so you are going to very quickly notice that you can't just have an unconstrained template parameter here. Um, whereas in this case, it's only when you happen to have something that has two different, two unrelated things that have clear on them that you actually match these things. So it gives you this false sense of security that this is well enough constrained to a particular um, separable type of interface sameness. And the, the reality is that it doesn't do that if you do it ad hoc like this. The reality is that you really want to use named concepts as much as possible that span all of the different types of requirements, even if you don't use those methods or those names inside of here. right? Um, there is a lot of utility to over-constraining, even if you don't use those things. And that's a whole other talk, too, that I could give about why concepts are dangerous, why you should use named concepts, why requires requires is an anti-pattern. Anyone else have a question? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so you don't, right. You could do a piecewise feature. You, 
So the, the, the question was for um, name forwarding, uh, which I talked about, ooh, how did I do that? Um, which I talked about um, back here. Uh, Right, could you have a, uh, oh, it's not here, it's here. Um, could you have a uh, compiler feature that was not generalized reflection that did this? Absolutely, absolutely. It would be another piecewise feature, just like three-way comparison, right? It's adding more cognitive load for something that can be implemented in a more general mechanism as a library feature. Right, so yes, you could, you could absolutely do this. You could have name forwarding be a language feature, but I don't think it's sustainable to add language features for everything that we want that can be done with generalized reflection as a library feature. But that is a good point. That is absolutely a good point. Um, okay, I'll, I'm going to take a couple more questions. I have one more thing, and then I'm, I will take any number of questions out in the hallway or over email and everything after that. So there's one here and one here. So I think uh, Rust macros, they have a lot of cognitive load on the macro implementers, but very little on macro users. Um, and uh, does Rust reflection seem to, I don't know, seem to have loads to uh, both of them? Or can you talk a So, bit? yeah. Um, the, the comment was that Rust macros have a lot of cognitive load on the, the macro implementer, and um, this, is, this is the Rust equivalent of reflection and reification, uh, uh, Rust macros and, and proc macros. There's, there's two different things in Rust. And they have a lot of cognitive load on the uh, implementer and very little on the uh, user, and, and that's exactly right. And the, and the comment was that C++ seems to be putting it on both. Um, part of that? is because we haven't developed an ecosystem of reflection-based libraries like Rust has, and Rust library developers have gotten very good at shifting that cognitive load, um, because if they don't, then people don't use their libraries. No one has gotten good at that for C++, right? So we don't, we don't really know what that's gonna look like, regardless of which reflection proposal gets accepted, or if any of them do. Um, there is, there is no, like, we don't really know. Um, that said, absolutely. We don't need anything uh, great. Like, we're actually at Google looking at, Clang has this built-in reflection feature called built-in dumpstruct, double underscore built-in dumpstruct. It is the clunkiest thing I've ever seen. It takes the members of a structure and uh, prints the names to, like, it's like a, I, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's like a, it, you give it a char star with a large enough allocated thing, um, allocated at compile time or something, and, and it O streams into it or something. Like, it is the biggest of all messes, right? And we were talking at C++ now, like, 70% of the stuff I want to do with reflection, I could do with that. Just standardize that, I'd be okay. Like, we don't have to use that as the only thing ever. Just standardize something, something really clunky and really dumb, watch the ecosystem de develop, and then standardize something better. Rust did this. It has two different macro systems, right? Um, and I don't know if they were standardizing sequence or not, but the, the, the point remains, right? Like that we don't need anything great. Give us dumpstruct. Watch the ecosystem that develops, and then develop more things around that. Um, so yes, absolutely great point. Uh, one more question. Um, I think that maybe if we only had like code generation thing big enough, at least for non-third party types, that we will be able to generate the reflection metadata along with the user data. Do you think like it will be sufficient? And it's not so the comment was that if we just had code generation, um, which is the uh, reification is effectively that. It's, uh, it's turning um, types as values back into types so that we can actually generate code with it, right? Um, and the, uh, what was your, your comment? Was that we just need code generate, well, we need some way to get the, the types into values in order to do logic on them, right? So we still need reflection, which is what I, so, 
Ah. Uh, So you're talking about code generation external to the standard or external to the compiler? Um, or in the standard? Because you can't really write portable C++ with that, right? That's the problem. Sure. Yeah, there are, there are libraries for this, right? There are plenty of good libraries for, with macros. There are very creative ways of doing this. Um, yeah, and, and there's, there's plenty of things that I would love to go into there. And, and um, yeah, let's, let's take this offline and, and discuss more. Um, OK. Um, am I good? All right. Uh, one more thing I want to bring, about, bring up. Um, like, I have uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, Eliza Schlesinger. Um, every time she has a special, she, she's like, um, I have a mic, and you have to listen to me right now. And so I'm going to say something important. Um, well, I have a mic, and you have to listen to me right now. So I'm going to say something important. Um, I'm transgender. Most of you knew that. Some of you didn't. Um, that's really hard for me to say uh, in front of this many people. But um, I don't talk about it much because it's, it's pretty irrelevant. Um, and, and also because unconscious bias is real, I actually think that most people will understand me better and understand how I interact with the world better if you don't know that I'm trans. I'm, I'm an ordinary woman, really. Um, but there is one thing that's important for you to know, and that's that I, I wouldn't be alive. I wouldn't be right here um, if it weren't for gender-affirming health care. Um, and in the United States in particular right now, this is, this is really under attack. Uh, politicians are trying to take this away from us really in the past three months. I don't know if the news of that has reached you here in Israel. I know that the situation in Israel here is not much better. Um, and um, in the United States alone, this year alone, more than 500 pieces of legislation have been introduced trying to limit my rights. Um, and I don't want to make this political. I don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to hurt anyone. I just want to be a normal woman. I just want to be alive. Um, so I mean, I'm not going to say much more about that, but I do want to say, like, please think about that before you support a politician that wants to take my rights away. Uh, thanks. <laughs>